Um, so the first thing I'm going to say is that I'm going to talk about several different architectures. So probably what I should have called this talk is open source software development on non-x86 architectures. But the truth is, I work on mainframes, not those ones, not, not movie mainframes. <laughs> I'm going to get in trouble for this slide. <laughs> um, there, there is like a YouTube mashup like of like movie mainframes. I, I recently saw Argyle in the theater, and that has a whole mainframe thing where they hack the mainframe. It's, it's hilarious. I couldn't find a picture of that because for some reason, no one wanted to take a screenshot of a movie that's still in theater of the mainframe scene. I don't know. <laughs> All right, that is a mainframe. That is actually a mainframe made out of Legos, 250,000 Lego. And that was at a conference. So IBM Marketing had this great idea. It was an actual great idea. And they, they built a whole one out of Lego. Um, it's got this drawer that pulls out. It's got these, all these little Lego people in it. It's, it's actually a lot of fun. Um, but no, no, just kidding. OK, seriously, this is what I work on. <laughs> um, these are mainframes that are modern for today. I mean, these ones were released a couple of years ago. The, the one that's um, rack mountable, that was released last year. Um, but effectively, the, the mainframe today, it's like fits into a 19 inch rack spot in the single frame version. They're expandable up to four frames, and the configurations inside of them like change a lot depending on which one you buy and what your resources are inside of them and everything. Um, but the rack mount one, that's kind of like your super entry level one. You can put it in your rack with everything else. Um, the installer people say don't put it in the rack with a fish tank. Uh, but <laughs> but <laughs> You know, there's a lot of like rules and stuff around these things. Anyway, so this is like what you're going to look for if you're going to look for a mainframe today. So put aside all the old thoughts. Um, it is this year the 60th anniversary of the IBM 360, which is pretty exciting. So these, this 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 um, heritage and this this legendary architecture has now been around for 60 years now. Of course, these days it's 64-bit. The latest chip has like an AI accelerator inside of it, and like all this modern fancy stuff that we're continuously developing. Um, which is to say, I work for IBM, but <laughs> but okay. I did not always work for IBM. I actually just joined IBM about five years ago. Prior to that, I worked in the Ubuntu community. I worked and I wrote, helped write a book. Um, I worked in the OpenStack community when I worked over at HP. Um, I worked for a container startup in San Francisco. And if you want some whiplash, go from working to, from, at a container startup in San Francisco to working on mainframes in, in, at IBM. <laughs> and I had a baby in between there, so that was fun. <laughs> um, but anyway, I'm like a Linux person. I've been coming to scale forever um, since I moved to California in 2010. Um, so in this talk, I'm going to be talking about Linux development specifically, um, even though I'm going to be talking about a few boards that run lots of various different things on them. Um, and I had this quote from a friend of mine in IRC the other day, and he was like, I, what did he say? He said, I think it's safe to say that once a weird new platform, these are not weird new platforms. He said it, not me. Um, get full Linux support, then it's mature enough to use. And that was, I thought that was funny. And I'm like, I'm going to put that in my talk. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I work on IB, I work for IBM. I mostly know about mainframes, but I am, I've talked to some, some experts in the field to get a taste for what's out there for other open source projects as well. So just to kind of level set and get us all on the same page, um, here are some of the architectures that, that I'm going to focus on and what you may see out there in the world. Um, so the first one is ARM. I, I alphabetized it because I'm not going to play favorites and I don't want to get in trouble. Um, I'll, I'll also say I'm, I'm not going to tell you when you should use one of these architectures versus another. That's kind of above my pay grade. And I, you know, it's, you're going to get a different answer if you ask me versus someone from ARM or the RISC-V community. So alphabetized, neutral. <laughs> I just happen to know more about some. Anyway, so ARM. If you're in the open source world in this known as column, I kind of put like what the short code is for them in like the binary. So if you see a binary in an open source project, um, they're probably not going to call it IBM Z. They're going to call it S390X. Um, same, you know, Risk Five. I also focused on 64-bit architectures. Um, you will see 32-bit numbers in there, but you can tell that they're 32-bit because they either say 32 or it's like ARM with no qualifiers. It's just ARM. That is typically what they'll refer to as 32-bit. Um, in S390X land, it would be called S390 if it's the 31-bit version. <laughs> um, and yeah, RISC-V doesn't really have. Um, and PowerPC, PPC 64LE. That mouthful stands for PowerPC 64-bit 
little endian. And endianness is a type of thing that happens with the processors. The only big endian on this list is the IBM Z. Um, but Power used to have a big endian version. And so they, they specified that in the, in the short code for it. Um, I also did not include MIPS on here. So if we have any hardware geeks being like, where's MIPS? Honestly, there just aren't developer programs out there for that. That in, in when I asked my embedded friends, they're like, I haven't seen a MIPS processor in a little while. So I was like, when they're when they're more, they can be added to this talk later. But for now, I'm not covering MIPS. I'm just covering these four. Oh yeah. So I want to ask, who has used any of these before? What what are we using? Do I'll throw out just shout out some answers. Arm. Arm. All right. Who has a Raspberry Pi? Who has more than two? <laughs> That's what I thought. <laughs> we have a lot of hands staying raised in this audience for the recording here. <laughs> I, I, yeah. Um, so anyway, so and, and and what they're used for. So in the case of ARM and Risk Five, typically we're going to see these. They're going to see them in microcontrollers, embedded spaces, um, desktops, laptops. Um, you know, the new Apple laptops are, are running um, ARM. ARM based processors. Um, servers, you know, Amazon now has, a, has an ARM offering in their cloud. I think Google does as well. Um, so these are popping up all over the place. Um, you know, our phones, these are all ARM. Um, and so that's, and then in RISC-V, it kind of plays in a similar space. Um, there's a lot, of, a, lot, a lot of stuff happening with microcontrollers now. Um, I brought this little uh, prop along. This is a, a Vision 5.2. This is a RISC-V SBC, a single board computer. Um, it worked about three days before I came here, and then I flashed the firmware and bricked it and didn't have time to fix it. But I assure you, it was running Debian. I have a photo. <laughs> um, and so in, in those two cases, like, they, they, they're, they're kind of all over the place. They have various things. Um, in IBM Z and Power, these are both servers. Um, the processor for an IBM Z system, the air-cooled one, has a heat sink about this big. So you wouldn't want that in your phone. Um, so, the kind of where where you land with like what what processor you select and and what what architecture you're using, it's going to depend a lot on various factors. Um, one of them is size. So you're going to go with a a processor that's smaller um, if you need one that's smaller <laughs> that doesn't have you know a six inch heat sink on top of it. Um, other considerations. Um, a big one is power. Um, of course, on, on something like a cell phone, you can't have something that draws a lot of power. At least it has to draw power in a very different way um, than something like a, um, an open power system or something. Um, a few other things to keep in mind um, how fast you want it to be. I mean, the processor in my phone is not as fast as a processor in a mainframe. Um, reliability. Uh, you do get different varying levels of quality based on what you buy. Like a Raspberry Pi is probably not the same quality as what you're going to find in your MacBook Pro, right? Like it's just different different levels of tolerance and other things. Um, one thing I wanted to explain here is the tooling question: is that there are some environments where, like, if you're in a specific industry or if you're working on like a, a really low level microcontroller thing, there may be more tools on something like, you know, maybe there's more tools on RISC-V than there is on ARM or the other way around. Um, you kind of just, a lot of decisions are made based on where there is critical mass already in the industry and so that's where the tooling is, so that's where you have to develop for. Um, and same thing goes for like power and mainframe if you're doing some sort of legacy upgrade um, you may find that your tools are in one place and your industry is in one place and that's kind of where you're going to stay for the, for the time being, at least. Um, I'll explain this, these pictures here. So this is all from my home office. Um, I have a, like the, the big metal banner from the IBM 360, which is like the first mainframe um, you know, sitting behind my desk. Um, I also, I was kind of interested in hardware architectures before I joined IBM. Um, so I have a Sun Ultra 10, which is the Spark 64 architecture. So I used to run Debian on that thing forever. Um, the hard drive died, and I haven't resurrected it yet. But soon, I'm going to ruin my electric bill by running it. <laughs> um, and then the last one, that is the risk, the, the Vision 5.2 board all hooked up on my desk um, before my five-year-old pulled out the ribbon and said, I want this rainbow ribbon. <laughs> but it's that the cable's fine, the board is fine. It was my fault it broke. <laughs> So that's kind of like why these various hardware architectures exist. I mean, there's lots of different reasons. And I, I also tell this story as like, there used to be more hardware architectures in the industry, like in the 90s. And when the Sun Ultra 10 came out, um, there, were, there were more architectures. But we kind of 
congregated on x86 for like these really new cloud-based deployments and like all the, all the things that came out with you know the rise of Linux and everything um, because at some point hardware got cheaper than anything else and so it was easy to say like hey I can just fill my data center with cheap x86 boards um, that are basically open at this point um, and I, if they die I just replace them which is cheaper than replacing something that might be more expensive um, or more complicated. But in recent years, all of these needs and priorities have become, have come back. So now it is no longer cheaper to run a data center full of x86 machine, machines for every company because sometimes the power considerations are, are, are um, a problem or sometimes they need a GPU farm and maybe the x86 is not necessarily serving the need that it needed to. So there's been a lot of interest in it. And that's why companies like Google and Amazon have started looking into ARM and Apple, of course, for their laptops, to try to look at ar hardware architectures again and come back and say, like, we need to revisit this. Um, so one of the first questions I had when I joined IBM to work on mainframes, which, which was an interesting question, because I had just worked on containers at a fancy startup, and then they're like, hey, you want to work at IBM on mainframes? And I'm like, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> What's a mainframe? <laughs> um, so my first question was like, okay, you say Linux runs on these things, but what does that mean? Like, Linux is made up of thousands of packages, and this is a different hardware architecture. You would have to recompile every single one of those packages to run Linux on it. And they're like, yeah, that's what we do. <laughs> So Red Hat, SUSE, Canonical, they all have mainframes in their environment. And for all these architectures, all of the ones that support these various architectures, they all are building, usually for the Linux distribution specifically, they are building on bare metal. Um, and so they, you know, the, the one, they have power machines, they have ARM machines, they have RISC-V machines in their data center that they're running all these automated builds on, which I'll get to in a little bit. But that was, that was I mean, obvious but also somewhat surprising because that seems like a lot of work. <laughs> so you may be thinking at this point if you are a software maintainer that okay I'm here to learn how to port my software but you're saying it's already there because it's already in the Linux distribution. I'm done. We can end this talk and go home. <laughs> All right. That might be the case. However, there's a bunch of things you have to keep in mind. If your project is included in a Linux distribution already um, first, it would have to be in a repository that they're actually building for the architecture. In most cases, this means like a main or a core or a supported repository because the distributions will put a lot of work into building for other architectures, but they're not going to build every single thing that every random community member has ever built um, and, and ported over. Um, or maybe they will. I mean, SUSE does a ton of builds for the community, so <laughs> um, they're, you know, the, they want to, but like in terms of support and just anything breaks on an architecture, someone has to fix it. So first, it has to be in the repository that's being built for that. Secondly, it has to be important enough um, for it to stay there. So I'll, I'll tell a story in a little bit about one of the packages that we discovered recently that might not stay um, in the mainframe space, but if it breaks, the distribution developers then have to pause and say like, okay, what is this debug log telling me about this package that failed to build on a specific architecture? And does anyone even use this package? They may look up like statistics of download statistics. They may ask their clients and say like, hey, like, is anyone actually using this project? Who's paying us? Um, and if it's easy enough for them to fix, they may not go through that trail. They may just fix it and move on. Um, but if it actually becomes a problem, they may be like, hey, like, maybe we just don't build this sp specific package for this architecture, and then they kick it out. So how do you test for yourself? <laughs> so there's a few mechanisms for testing software on various architectures. Um, the first one is, is the easiest one. It is cross-compiling. So as you can see from this definition here, cross-compiling is essentially you're on like one architecture and you're using emulation to build the package for another architecture. Um, you've probably heard of QEMU. That's the most popular one in this space. Um, QEMU is built into a lot of CI tooling. Um, a lot of projects do this to do all of their testing on various architectures. Um, it's open source, which is nice. Um, 
and so it's a, it, it, it's a very easy path. Um, there's also a project called Unicorn. Um, Unicorn focuses more, it's like QEMU is kind of like a more holistic testing thing. It's like pretends you're like on a little, you know, environment. Um, Unicorn is more based on CPU functionality. So again, since I know most about mainframes, like I, mainframe has an AI accelerator, maybe we'll add some functionality in Unicorn to sort of mimic that. Um, and that would be like a CPU operation rather than something that's more broad, like the QEMU environment. Um, so some projects are using Unicorn for certain subsets of their, of their cross-compiling and testing. Um, also, at the end of the talk, I'm going to share a bunch of resources from various communities. Some of the architectures, um, they have specific like tool sets that developers can download to start doing work on their projects. So they'll be like, some of them are proprietary tooling, some of them are like hosted tooling, um, but there's other ones out there that are specific to specific architectures. So the problem with cross-compiling is one, it, it doesn't, it won't include all the features of an architecture. Um, they're usually going to be playing catch-up because um, most architectures don't send engineers to work directly on QEMU to make sure it's fully supported. <laughs> um, I mean, I know like my, my teams at IBM, like we definitely contribute to QEMU, but it's not going to have feature parity with, with the, um, the chip um, just because it's not super possible. <laughs> um, so it's not going to have all the features. Um, it's not going to have a full environment. So like in, in the case of something like RISC-V, your boot environment is very important. Um, this thing boots off a little piece of firmware that I bricked right before I got here. <laughs> and, but th that's just the firmware on this specific board. Um, like that's not something that's going to be in your QEMU testing environment. So you can test that the package will build once you have a running Linux environment, but you're not going to be able to test like the entire um, you know path to get that that booted Linux install. And if you're just testing your single application, maybe that doesn't matter. Um, but if your single application is systemd, um, maybe you're going to care a little bit more about that. And again, thing like interaction with the disk, interaction with network. If you're tooling has anything to do with this and you have to do network tests, you have to do disk tests, um, that's not really going to be working well or um, effectively in an emulated environment. Um, and similarly, like interoper uh, interoperability with peripheral device devices. Um, this is important, especially in like the embedded space where maybe you have sensors or you have other things, but even, even the work that I do, I mean, there's tons of devices that connect to mainframes and we're not going to test those in emulation. Um, and so you may not have access to that. You may not be able to test that. Finally, I say it may run slowly. It is going to run slowly. <laughs> emulation is very CPU intensive. Um, and so whatever tests you're running, um, you may find that it's not running as quick as you want. So. Another option, if you're not going to cross-compile, you're going to do it natively. OK. So depending on the architecture, you know, it may be like that single board computer. It may be like the Raspberry Pi or the Vision 5.2 I have over here. Or if you can't set one on your desk, like in the case of an IBM Zero power system, <laughs> um, there, may, there, there, there are providers out there like, that give out virtual machines to open source projects. Um, and there are programs for, for the, the larger architectures. There are some around there for pretty much all the architectures at this point, programs for developers, um, which I'll talk about. But like, yeah, either you have one on your desk or you've got a virtual machine somewhere. But either way, these are native environments that are provided to open source communities. Now, the problem with these, of course, <laughs> first, you have to get access to them. Um, so I can speak, you know, as, as the person who runs the open source program for IBM Z, I can give any of you a VM if you have an open source project, so let me know later. <laughs> um, and so we have a program for this. Um, most of the architectures have programs for getting access so you can actually build natively. But the next, the next one it can be a challenge if, if you sign up for, you know, the RISC-V developer program and they ship you a Vision 5.2 and you're like, awesome, I'm going to run my whole open source project on this little board through my home internet connection. <laughs> Good luck. No, so you're, you're probably, if you're going to be actually running it, like triggering runs from, you know, your CI from GitHub or something and you expect other people to be running tests on this hardware, um, you really want to have a good internet connection. Um, I don't know, set it on top of your 1U in your data center that you totally have. Um, <laughs> but you do need to have a well-connected hosting environment um, in order to make that work really well. Another one that comes up a lot for me is that you have to maintain this Linux environment. 
Now maybe your open source project has it all together and you have Ansible scripts that will deploy it on any VM and it will be automatically maintained and everything will stay up to date. And I'm so proud of you. <laughs> but for the rest of us, um, we're, we're sitting over here running apt update and <laughs> um, doing release upgrades and managing just another Linux install in my fleet of servers that I do testing on. And we get resistance from some projects who are like, listen, like, I'm glad that I got this free resource, but you know, we just don't see the value in the platforms. I don't want to maintain another Linux install for something I, I don't see the value in right now. Um, so that's, that's definitely one thing you have to keep in mind. Um, and again, just like with emulation, you're still not going to have access to every feature and peripheral advice, device that you want to test. Um, so in the VMs that I give out, like, we work with communities. If they say, like, hey, we need a different type of disk or we need this peripheral attached to the machine, we can have a discussion about that, but I'm not going to guarantee it. <laughs> um, and same, like, you know, like, and also when you're thinking about, like, the Raspberry Pi or the RISC-V, like, there are lots of manufacturers building these out, and there's lots of different types of machines. So while you can confirm that it actually does run on the architecture, you know, Raspberry Pi is just one type of ARM processor. You're probably going to want a Mac in there somewhere, too, because that one looks very different than a Raspberry Pi. There's also multiple types of Raspberry Pi. There's the 32-bit and the 64-bit. So <laughs> you, there's um, a, lot, a lot of variation out there as you look across architectures and what's available. So. Again, you're not going to have access to every device, probably. And the other thing I want to touch upon is, is programming languages. Um, so the first thing you want to do is you want to confirm that there is support for the compiler or the interpreter on the architecture. And I said most are these days. And then I saw the keynote this morning, and I don't think Julia has been ported to all of these <laughs> architectures. <laughs> so if your pro project runs in Julia, you might want to check on that. I have not checked on that, but just, you know, this is, this is where you check. Like you say, I mean, if it's in Python, you're going to be fine any, anywhere. Um, and if, you're, if it's C, you're fine anywhere. But you got to check, make sure that, like, first, that your project can actually build on that architecture because the compiler or the interpreter is already there. Um, there's also this kind of nebulous idea of a higher level versus a lower level language. And everyone's spectrum on this is, is very different. Um, mine has changed over time, as you may expect. Um, but like higher level, you would think something like Node.js is a very high level language. It's very much abstracted from whatever it's running on. And in those cases, if it runs on Node, it probably just runs fine everywhere. It has no awareness of the hardware. <laughs> it has no idea where it's running. It's fine. If your program is written in C, and you're doing more hardware aware things, you might run into some more challenges. Um, and again, Python kind of lands in the high level area too. Like it's probably gonna run fine unless you're really running like, like very hardware specific things. Like if you're running, I mean, if you think about it, like you would have to go out of your way to run things that are, that are um, very specific to an x86 hardware, but that's changing. I mean, AMD and Intel both have different things that are being built into their CPUs now that you can hook into. So you have to just, check if you're doing any of that. And same with the other ones, like the, the mainframes, they have like on-chip compression and decompression. Like if you're using gzip on a mainframe, that goes directly to the hardware, the CPU is handling that. Um, and there's also a crypto card or crypto chip in there too. So if you're going directly to that, you have to just be aware that you're doing a hardware thing. And then when you port it, you have to keep that in mind. Um, uh, uh, someone uh, that, I, that I know on Mastodon also, like Colin, he was, he just, he chimed in too. And he, he mentioned like, you know, things like, you know, unsigned and signed integers. And I, I just want to say, like, numbers will mess you up, too. <laughs> um, if, you, if you see, like, a wall of numbers when you're, like, dealing with Big Endian or something, I'm like, yeah, I've been there, too. It's scary, but it's, it's not that scary. Like, it's just scary at first. Um, but they will trip you up because also things like memory addressing and, like, things that you may have never encountered before if you've never worked on a different architecture are things that are going to start cropping up. Maybe. If you've written everything in Python, you're going to be fine be fine. <laughs> so I've kind of set the stage here, and now we are ready to take your open source project, and we're going to actually build, build your pipeline out here. So I put together this chart. I'm not going to go through every single thing on here, because if you're using one, you're only interested in that one, so that'll be boring. But I will explain the slide a little bit. So these are on, on oh, way over there. Um, these are a bunch of. Um, uh, CI systems that I encounter frequently in the open source projects that I, I in work with. I know there's lots of other CI systems out there. Um, there's lots of proprietary ones. There's, I mean, there's probably a hundred CI systems out there that people use. <laughs> um, but these are the ones I'm, I'm regularly encountering in, in the work that I do. 
Um, and then on the top, of course, the architectures. So when I say hosted, what I mean by that is that a, a company that is, that is sort of responsible for the CI system offers a hosted environment. So in the case of GitLab Community Edition, if you have an open source project and you want to test it on ARM, you can do it through like their web interface with like the free account that they give you. You can test on x86, you can test on ARM. When I say self-hosted, that means you have to download a binary of the runner and then run it on your own system. So that free VM we got you, or the you know Vision 5.2 that you have set up on your desk, you have to run the binary there. I actually, on my Raspberry Pi at home, I have the Circle I CI client running, because that's a self-hosted one on IBM, or on ARM. So I have it running on an ARM system, and I have it running on an IBM Z VM. So every time I run a test on this one specific project, it comes back with results on multiple architectures. And that was so satisfying to set up. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the other one, there's um, one on here that says self-hosted unofficial, and in this case, um, GitHub Actions is open source, but GitHub has not accepted um, patches for IBM Z and Power, um, so we have a patch that you can apply to GitHub Actions upstream, and then you can run it yourself. So it's like, it's not from GitHub, I mean, the original source code is, but the sources from GitHub, the patches from IBM and a partner, and then you run it again on your own VM. And then the OSU hosting, that's um, the Oregon State University Open Source Lab. Um, they are hugely supportive of the open source community. And if you haven't seen one of Lance's talks before, I, I highly recommend it. He's, he's doing some great work up there at the, at the, at the lab. Um, but they offer hosting for Jenkins, for IBM Z and Power. Um, so you can apply to their program and they can give you some runners on, on their Jenkins instance, which will allow you to run, um, integrate with your, your Jenkins environment. Um, and I, I was sad that the RISC-V column is a little, a little empty, but RISC-V is rather, I mean, it's the newest, the newest kid on the block on this chart. <laughs> um, so that's, eh, it's somewhat to be expected. And I left them blank because I, I, I know some of these really don't have any, even a self-hosted option, but I'll fill them in when they do. So we're good. <laughs> And I stopped by the Jenkins booth to make sure that no one's offering an ARM-hosted solution. And as far as the guy at the booth knew, he said he doesn't know of anyone who's offering free to open source community ARM hosting. Um, but it's, it's just Jenkins. So if you, found, if you had an ARM server or whatever, you can just install Jenkins on it. So um, I should have put self-hosted in here, actually. Oops. OK. So. You're in good shape. You got your CI pipeline, you got your VMs, you got your little little cute little boards. Everything's building for your architecture, whichever one or all of them you chose. The next problem that we have encountered is maintainers feeling somewhat isolated. So suddenly you become the go-to person in your project. Everyone's like, "All right." Liz is working on mainframes. Every time we have a mainframe project, project question, we have to ask her. She can never go on vacation around release time because if something breaks on the architecture, we're either kicking the architecture out or we're halting the release. <laughs> Neither of which will make Liz happy. Um, and so it kind of, and then like everyone asks you the questions, everyone tags you in the bugs, and you find you feel like in your project, you know, which is your whole world, that you're the only one in the world who cares about this and you can never go on vacation. <laughs> um, your poor little baby architecture farm will just die if you're not around. Um, so what, what we've done in the mainframe space, and I've sort of seen this started to happen in, in other architectures, is just finding, finding people to like talk to about this. So what we did, so there's, um, there's a Linux Foundation project called the Open Mainframe Project um, that I do a lot of work with, and we created a Linux distributions working group inside of there. And what we did is, I don't know, it's, this is like an eye chart here, but you can see like some people from, from our last meeting um, a few days ago. Um, there's someone from Debian. Um, there's someone from this Red Panda project. It's, it's just an open source project. Um, there's um, a woman there from SUSE, um, someone from Rocky Linux, and then someone from OpenSUSE who all came to this meeting. And if you scroll down through the meetings, that's a pretty good characteristic. Actually, I'm, our Fedora guy wasn't at this last meeting. You know what? Daylight savings time messed it all up for the Europeans. So, but he's always there. I was surprised not to see him. But anyway, Fedora comes to these meetings too. But what this what this allows is, for one, it allows us to solve problems together. We put this working group together because all of these distributions are building all of these tens of thousands of packages, and we see build errors. So my my favorite story, perhaps, of this is. 
there was a build error that Sarah found in OpenSUSE. And she had just found it like a few minutes before the meeting. We have like monthly meetings. And she hops on the meeting and she's like, ah, oh, everything's good except I just saw this build error. And uh, Dan from Fedora, he was like, actually, that looks very familiar. Just give me a sec. So he found the patch in Fedora that fixed the same exact problem in Fedora, and now OpenSUSE has the patch. And the reason I love this story is because, you know what, Sarah probably could have gone and found this patch. She would have. I mean, she probably would have fit, checked Fedora's bug tracker and Debian's bug tracker to see if, if that had been a problem. But there's a lot of steps you go through when you're a distribution package maintainer when you're looking at these. Because distribution package maintainers, they are responsible to, for tens of thousands of packages. <laughs> they get very good at reading debug logs across a bunch of languages, but they aren't familiar with every single one of those pieces of software. So the thing was, in this case, to get these tests to pass and to test this piece of software correctly, the only thing she needed to do was pass a very specific flag. Do you know how long that would have taken for her to figure out? I mean, Sarah's very smart, but like for any of us, it would have taken a while. And maybe you didn't know that flag existed. Maybe you're not very familiar with this software. Maybe you're digging around in source code and spending like three hours until you finally see, and now I know it's wrong, now I wonder how to fix it. <laughs> But in the course of this meeting, you know, like we solved it right there. Like, here's the patch. Let's go. Like, it's it was easy. Um, and that that's the kind of thing you have when you when you bring these groups together and and just have this. So that's the first thing. You actually are solving technical problems. Um, the second thing is I mentioned like access to peripheral devices and things. Um, so some so there's a couple of us from IBM who are on this call. And so if Suze comes along and says, Hey, we need to test this thing. We're like, all right, let's have a chat. <laughs> um, and in these cases, maybe we'll test it in one of our labs. Maybe we'll test it in our public environment. Um, or maybe we'll ship Suze the part that they need. Um, but it gets the companies together as well. Um, and in the case, I mean, this is not just for IBM. I mean, ARM has a company as well. Um, and same with IBM Power. Like, we being in touch with the community in this way and just being able to get that feedback without working through red tape and managers, like, we're all just nerds in a, in a room here. <laughs> um, and so the third thing is, is the thing I sort of touched upon earlier, which is like the isolation problem. All of these maintainers are the only one in their distribution who care about these architectures. Now, that's not very true, but that's how it feels because they're the one everyone comes to. And by coming together at this meeting, you're like, ah, oh, you're my people. You understand the pain of Big Endian. <laughs> um, but just generally, like, just, it, it makes them feel less lonely. And that is a huge thing. Um, so if you're an open source developer, maintainer, and you're playing around with these architectures, um, find your people. I mean, maybe, maybe it's us at the working group. Um, in the ARM community, there's developer resources in the RISC-V community. But just reach out, be, be present on the forums as much as you can, or at least know that they exist and that there are other people working on this, and periodically remind yourself of that when you start getting, if, if you get frustrated. If you're running in Python, you'll never have any problems. So. <laughs> all right, so, all right, we are doing excellent on time. So. I wanted to go through some of the resources that we have available for these various communities. Um, since my talk was very focused on Linux, um, these resources are actually across lots of different things. So in a microcontroller, you're not going to run Linux. But the developer resources are, are somewhat broad. Um, but open source communities um, qualify for these developer resources. Like some of them will actually list it out on their page. Like yeah, this includes open source communities as well as companies developing for it. So in the case of, of ARM, um, ARM has um, a developer program, um, and they have a booth in in the expo hall if you want to visit them later. Um, but they have a whole developer program. You sign up for it. You apply for it. I don't I don't know if you're automatically accepted or whatever, but. Um, in that developer world, they have documentation. Um, they have education in the form of like learning paths and training, and like specifications on all the boards that they that they partner with to release. Uh, they have like a whole community which has blogs and forums and a Slack. Or I don't I don't know if it's Slack. I don't some sort of chat mechanism. And then this is the one where I mentioned that they have an actual ARM development studio. So that's a it's it's a type of emulated environment that you would you know download the software onto your laptop um, and then do the development there. And they have like success kits and other things to try to make you successful. Um, so that's the link and, and the QR code goes to the link there. Um, for IBM Z, which I can answer the most questions about, <laughs> um, the big thing is is we give free access um, to S390X native virtual machines. Um, so there's there's one program that we have which is um, which is linked on this link here. Um, it's uh, anyone can sign up 
Um, we do some like fraud validation and stuff, and if you hit one of our fraud metrics, it bounces it to a person to manually approve it. But anyone can sign up for it, regardless of whether you're an open source developer or not. It's like specifically built for hobbyists and people curious about the platform. But it gives you a VM for 120 days. I think it's like 60 days, and then they email you, and you have to renew it for another 60 days. But you get to play around with it. Um, of course, the first thing I did with it was like install RC and go on IRC and show everyone in my channel like the output of LSPCU, LSCPU, because yep. <laughs> like, look, I'm running on a mainframe. I'm doing IRC from a mainframe. Okay, I'm sure there's better things you can do with it. No, um, the, the, we have a bunch of quick start guides, but honestly, like it's just Linux, so I mean, it's somewhat anticlimactic because you're like, cool, I got a VM on a mainframe. It's a bash prompt. <laughs> I'm gonna install Apache, <laughs> but it is it, it you know. But then that, but then you build your open source project and see if it works. It'll be fine. Um, but then this um, this link here on the Open Mainframe project it, it li links like you know the Circle CI and the GitHub and the GitLab like all the links to all the resources for that for this architecture. Um, and then we also have this community at community.ibm.com/z, um, which has it's not just open source. It's like all of the things, it's not just Linux either, it's also like all the proprietary stuff that, that is in ZOS and all the other tooling and everything. Um, but it's an interesting place if you're curious about mainframe technologies. Um, all right, so power. Um, so power has two kind of different components. So the ISA for power was open sourced a few years ago. Um, and so there is an open power foundation that exists now, it's part of the Linux foundation, just kind of like the open mainframe project is. Um, Open Power is its own foundation now, and now there's other companies aside from IBM who are making power boards. Um, most notably, you might have heard of Raptor. They used to come to open source conferences and give out boards periodically. Um, but those things are so expensive. I really want one, but like the desktop is like six thousand mm. um, dollars. But there's there's various programs. Um, this QR code actually goes to the IBM uh, the IBM community link, which lists through a bunch of them. Some of them are for partners, and some of them are for hobbyists, and some of them are for like open source developers. Um, but it's nice because this link gives you. It also goes through like how you would use QEMU to test your your system your project on Power. Um, and then there's the whole open Power community. Um, which is which is broader, and that has also like forums and working groups and chat and documentation of like the boards that are out there and whatnot. Um, and they're they're very cool people. Um, I, I work with them pretty closely. And then for Risk Five, um, so there is an application that you can fill out on. And with the Risk Five developer community to get a developer board, um, I think the Vision Five Two was on that list for a while. I don't know if it's still on there, but there's a bunch of companies that are offering boards to developers. Again, this is not just Linux development, and it's not just open source. Um, but these these two criteria that I pulled, from, I should have put quotes around them. But like the, so some of the criteria for being accepted into the developer program is like you have an impact and you have an upstream community. Um, you know you've proven open source contributor with you know links to your GitHub and stuff. Um, so if you're really interested in developing for RISC-V, they do have a program for that. And again, they also have technical chats and forums and mailing lists and documentation and all of that stuff that you'd expect from a developer community. And just like ARM, they do like they release all of like the tech specs and everything. Like when I was getting this this Vision 5.2 running, I was I was on their documentation quite a bit trying to find out what I was supposed to be doing right. <laughs> um, and and I didn't ask any questions. Other people had answered them already. So, but um, seems like a good gr group of folks. So, developer resources for them too. And this is where I come to my conclusion because I wanted to leave a bit of time for questions. Um, just special thanks to Michael, Linda, James, and Drew, all of whom I bothered a lot <laughs> to get information about their particular pain points and their developer programs to make sure I wasn't missing anything. So, uh, yeah, questions. Or well, we can, well, yeah, yeah. All right. Could I get a round of applause? Thank you for that lovely presentation, Elizabeth. And do we have any audience members that have a question? If you do, please raise your hand, and I'll come over with the microphone. Thank you, Mackenzie. Hi. Um, so I'm like super new to the um, sort of architecture porting realm. Uh, so forgive me if this question's a little elementary for this. When it comes to like collaborating online, you mentioned the sort of bus factor 
that you were indicating, mm -hmm. right? And so you can't get your vacation kind of thing. What What's something that's like, that you find helpful to do, like as a, like in your practice in the community to sort of re reduce that <laughs> <laughs> or increase yeah. the factor to no, no problem. Yeah, yeah, reducing the bus factor, it's always tough. I mean, the working group is kind of my first step on this path of like making sure that at least we have the community there of people you can you can commiserate with. Um, but then, <laughs> honestly, it's, I mean, I just like nerd out with all my friends. They're all so sick of hearing about mainframes. But then, you know, sometimes they're like, actually, that sounds kind of cool. Let me help you out with that. And like, you do sometimes get collaboration that way. Um, the thing, I, I think it's going to be different. Like, in mainframe space, I think it's going to be a little different than what you may find in like risk or ARM because those tend to be everyone has access to them. I mean, this risk five board cost me like 80 bucks. Um, and that's, I mean, yeah, like it's not nothing, but I, I mean, a mainframe starts at 100. I, yeah, I mean, we, we are like Linux One Express. We have a price on our website and that price is $135,000. That's the cheap one. <laughs> Yeah, and I mean, and we do have these programs. I mean, anyone can get a VM. And then our open source program, like, you can actually get a VM, like, forever. I mean, forever. Like, we renew it every year for you if, you, if you're still, you know, so still responding to our emails. But, like, the developer program we have, like, you can have a, one for your open source project. But from a hobbyist perspective, like, just not as many people are interested in mainframe as a hobby as they are in, you know, RISC-V. So, I mean, I'm still interested in it, even if I didn't, I'd I'm, I'm going to be interested in mainframes for my whole life now, even regardless of what happens. But, but Risk Five is like something I'm playing with as a hobby. Like, so I think, I think in some of these communities, you'll find it easier to find that collaboration. And it's also going to depend on the company, too. I mean, like, Canonical has someone who's fully, like, his, his full-time job is on IBM Z, and he's got some folks who are helping him at the company. And in those cases, it really is just a matter of the company you work for, like, giving you additional resources, and you being like, I can't do this myself because I need to go on vacation. <laughs> um, yeah. Thank you for answering the question. Of course. All right. I'll take another question from the audience. Hi. Thanks. Uh, I was wondering, in your view, where the responsibility falls when it comes to supporting or maintaining a uh, uh, new architecture? Is it the developer? Is it the uh, distribution? Is it the user? You know, in your personal view, we should maintain like architectures. Uh, like the holes, like the gaps? Yeah, or I don't know. As a developer, oh. personally, I don't care about, I don't know, uh, uh, open power. But some people might care about that. Should I uh, maintain uh, uh, open power? Should be the distribution maintaining open power? We should do that. Ah. Yeah, so who, sh who, should, who should do that? I mean, my, 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 I would love for the, all the open source projects to want, be the ones who care about that. And it comes down, like, do you want people to use your software? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, maybe say, like, you, 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 it doesn't matter if someone in open power can't run it. But, I mean, if, if someone who was, if, if a user came to you as a maintainer and said, or opened a bug report in your project and said, hey, we're using this, we're using your software, can you port it to this architecture? How would you feel? And I think that's a question that maintainers have to ask themselves. Like, I have a user here who uses this and wants to actively use my project. And it's going to vary from by maintainer. It's going to vary by project. Um, some projects have whole meetings about whether they want to support an architecture. And other ones are like, they come to me and they're like, I just found out about this program. That's so cool. I'm going to add it to my CI today <laughs> on a Saturday. And I'm like, awesome. <laughs> so it's, it's really going to depend on the maturity of the project and the type of project and, you know, who maintains that. And I, you know, as I said, like with the upstream Linux distribution support, there's some caveats to that. Like if you depend on the Linux distribution to do the work, um, it's not going to be guaranteed forever. Um, yeah. Great. More questions from the audience? I'm actually a Switch homebrew developer, so I have to deal with unconventional hardware all the time. <laughs> but I'm wondering what you personally think about hobbyists just using emulators like QEMU, and when, when do you draw the line and resort to actual hardware? When, when does it become important that you use actual hardware? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, so it's, it, it becomes important to work on actual hardware. So for one, um, 
I mean, the, the emulators are not gonna have every single feature of the architecture. Um, and so you may find you get bug reports from people who are actually running it on the hardware and they're saying the test fails and you're saying the test succeeds. And that's gonna be, a, that's kind of an obvious point where you're like, okay, clearly there's something that QEMU is mess missing, right? Um, the other one is that if your project very specifically, like, like I'm sure in your case, like if it really does have to have a real world environment to function, like it may be that you know, you don't, you can't test it because there is some sort of interaction that you can't, you can't replicate with an emulator. Um, and in that case, you do have to use something, something that's more native. Um, or if your project is very network intensive, you may not be able to rec rep replicate the network environment. Like I used to, in, when I, w I used to work for HP on the infrastructure for the OpenStack project and having to test a bunch of different permutations of the networking configuration was very hard to do in our virtualized emulated environment because there were too many layers of emulation at that point that like it was not an effective test and we had to go back to the developers and say like we can't test this with the resources we have because we're like layering on top of networking layers and like it just doesn't make sense anymore. <laughs> so. Yeah, just some things to consider. So like disk, networking, access to real world peripherals and devices, um, yeah. And the, I guess the complexity of the project too. Yeah. I'm wondering if your team or anyone you know ever contributes to QEMU for yeah. some small things. Yeah, oh yeah. So, okay, this is a complicated topic because IBM does not like it when people emulate our stuff, but it turns out we have, we have won the war of convincing them that it's more important to have this open source emulation software out there. So there are a lot of patches coming in from IBM now on both Power and NZ. Um, and it does from the ARM community as well and from RISC-V, like we're all on board now, like everyone is contributing to it. Um, it's never gonna be as good as, you know, native hardware, um, but yeah, there's a lot of contributions happening now and that's the floodgates have opened. So I'm very happy about that. <laughs> Fantastic. Any more questions from the audience? All right, I'm around all weekend, so if you find me in the hallway, I'm very shy, so please talk to me. And I'd be, I'd be so excited to talk about mainframes or any of these topics or show you the Risk Five board or whatever. It's fine. <laughs> I have stickers too, if you want to come up. <laughs> all right, everyone, this has been Will your open source project run on a, a mainframe and beyond? By Elizabeth K. Joseph. If you'd like to all give her a round of applause for her presentation today.